Father, we pray today that as we look into your holy, infallible, inerrant word, that, Lord, you will speak truth to us, that we be transformed more like Jesus, and that we leave this place acting more like Jesus. For it's in his holy name that I pray. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about renewing and uh, revi- reviewing and renewing our walk with God. The text this morning is Joshua chapter 24. The book of Joshua is in the Old Testament toward the front of your Bible, Joshua 24. I want to take for a text verse 14 and verse 15, but I'll be making reference to the entire chapter. Joshua chapter 24. And so we'll begin by reading verse 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers Uh, which your fathers served, which are beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Somebody said, and I found this out, uh, they said, getting old is not for sissies. And uh, the only people that laughed about that are old people, because they... (laughs) But I knew I was getting old because the other day I dropped something. And before I bent over to pick it up, I stopped and thought, should I wait till I drop two or three more things? That way I can just get it all at one trip. Uh, And so uh, another way you know you're getting old is you catch yourself yelling at the TV. (laughs) Old people in here laughed at that too. I, 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 my wife says they can't hear you. And I said, well, what else can I do? And it's aggravating because as we look at the 4th of July and we think about this country that we live in, this great country that we live in, that we're privileged to live in, this is not the America that I grew up in. And one thing about being an older senior citizen, I get the discount now, but other than that, uh, you, you have a reference point uh, that's, that's farther back, and you, you see more change. See, you was born in the 90s, you don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, this is not the country that it once was. Everything's different. And just about everybody knows that there's something is amiss. Something's wrong. The spiritual climate of America is not what it ought to be. Somebody said that, uh, as a matter of fact, Edmund Burke wrote, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Evil is rampant in our society today, and for some reason, people, a majority of people, I'm going to say, have lost the ability to care. Just to see what would happen, a couple of actors hired to play a disabled man and his caretakers went out on the street with a camera crew. The actors were placed in a city park with people all around. The caretaker, who was an actor, began to berate the older gentleman, abuse him, slap him, as people just strolled by. Only one out of 15 people even voiced an objection. We, we've lost our ability to care. Uh, I remember as a child, and, and uh, I remember going to Sunday school, and I remember hearing and, and hearing sermons preached about the whole episode with, with uh, uh, the angels that when they went into Sodom. And if you don't know that story, it's in Genesis 19. I'm not going to waste a lot of time, but God sent some angels in there to get Lot and his family out, and the nighttime came, and the, the, the perverted men in that city banged on the door and demanded that Lot let these two men out so that we may know them, they said. I remember hearing that story as a, as a teenager and as a young boy and thinking to myself, wow! This week, I flipped open my 
uh, uh, telephone, and one of the headlines that I saw was that, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but there's a bunch of men who dress up like nuns, and uh, they make fun of Christian symbols, and they, they pole dance with a cross. It's just disgusting. But the thing that caught my eye was they blatantly chanted while they were denigrating Christianity, we're coming for your children. Now let that sink in, because not even Sodom was that vile. And so we see things that are going wrong, and it makes you want to yell at the television. But yelling at the television doesn't make a difference. What can we do? What can we do? Well, I think it's time and high time for God's people and America for us to review and renew our Christian heritage. In this passage that we're looking at this morning, Joshua brings the nation together. It's the end of his life. Joshua has served well. He has led well. And he's learned under Moses, and he was one of those faithful spies that originally went in. He wandered through the wilderness with the people for 40 years. He was in charge when the Jordan River split as they went in and conquered the promised land. It says in uh, verse 31 of this chapter, it gives a great epitaph of Joshua's life. It says, Israel, that's the children of Israel, serve the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Man, that's a great testimony. But I believe Joshua knew, based on what he is saying here in this text, they had drifted spiritually. They had brought in some gods from across the Jordan River, from the Moabites and from Babylon. And some of the local gods they began to worship, the gods of the Amorites and the Canaanites. And Joshua knew that that was a violation of their covenant with God. And so Joshua brought them together so that they could review all the good things God had done in their life, and then he calls them to renew their commitment to the Lord God. And so today our nation celebrates our founding. And I think it'd be good for all of us as Christian citizens to review and renew our commitment to the Lord God. And so the central truth this morning is God's people should frequently review and renew their walk with the Lord. Now, this whole chapter is divided into two parts. I'll give you the two parts without reading the whole chapter. The first part is in verses 1 through 13, 1 through 13, and that is a review of the covenant. Uh, Joshua talks about the past. He talks about their history. And then the second part begins in verse 14, and that is where he calls them to renew this covenant. And uh, ultimately, Joshua calls them to a decision. He says, you got to make a choice. Are you going to serve these pagan gods or are you going to serve the Lord God? Make up your mind, get off the fence, stop straddling the fence and get in or get out. That's what he's saying. And so they chose to serve the Lord. Now I want you to see the first part. First thing I want you to see is the call to review the covenant. The call is in verse 1, chapter 24, verse 1. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and he called for the elders of Israel and for their heads of their judges, their officials, and they presented themselves before God. Now, the first thing he wanted them to do in this review is he reviewed to them how God had bought their liberty. And that's what we need to do this morning. I want you to review this morning how that God has bought your freedom. Joshua reminds them that they were bought by blood. They were bought by the blood of the Passover lamb. Later, uh, when they left Egypt, they got to Mount Sinai. And at the base of Sinai, you remember, God brought Moses up on top of the mountain. He gave him the Ten Commandments. Moses came down with those stones and all that drama that went on there. But basically, the Ten Commandments was God's covenant with Israel. And it's really much larger than the Ten Commandments, but uh, they call that the law. We call it the law. It's the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, if you will. 
And so uh, Moses received that covenant, and when he came down and he read it to the people, he sealed that covenant by sprinkling blood on the people. Listen to this, Exodus 24, verse 7 and 8. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. That was an awful church service to be at, don't you think? Wow. But listen, God has always sealed covenants and made covenants based on blood. Listen to what the Bible says. Do you realize that you and I were redeemed by a covenant of blood? Listen to what the Bible says in Revelation 5. It's a picture in heaven where there are thousands and thousands and myriads and myriads of angels all singing with a loud voice, and they sang a new song, Revelation 5, 9. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seal, for you were slain, listen, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and have made them a kingdom and priest of God, and they will reign on the earth. You and I, if we've been saved, it's because Jesus Christ suffered and died and shed his blood on Calvary's cross. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Joshua brings these leaders together. And he reviews the events of that faithful night when the children of Israel, by faith, applied that blood of the lamb to the doorpost, and the angel of death passed over them. And when the angel of death saw the blood and passed over them, they were then liberated from slavery. They were liberated from the tyranny of Egypt. In the same way, we as Christians need to remember that we have also been purchased with blood. Peter calls it precious blood, the blood of a spotless lamb. Now listen, that blood, it is that blood, it is that precious blood that draws a distinction between who is liberated and who is not. That night as they uh, applied the blood of that, of, of that, by faith, they put the blood upon the doorpost. Everyone who applied the blood by faith was delivered from the death that was coming. But those people who refused and rejected, those Egyptians and even maybe anybody that was there that didn't believe and didn't, didn't paint the door, that, that, that was their destruction. Beloved, let me tell you something. You were bought with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is that blood that distinguishes you from the rest of the world. The world is never, ever going to approve of us. Think about this for a minute. Just imagine, if you will, there's an Israelite, and uh, uh, they're in Egypt, and, and, and they painted the blood and everything, and the death angel passed over, and the next morning they walk out, and they say, well, Moses, I tell you, I'm glad we got delivered. But I just tell you what, I got a nice house here. I got a really nice place here, and I hate to just walk off into the wilderness without it. And maybe these Egyptians are not as bad as we think they are. Let's, let, let's try to make some disciples out of some of them. Do you see how ridiculous I'm talking? And yet today, there is this movement amongst God's people to somehow or another uh, attract people by becoming like the world. The world is never going to uh, uh, approve of God's Word. Leonard Ravenhill, that great evangelist, used to say, the problem these days is that the world has become so churchy and the church has become so worldly that it's impossible to tell the difference. Joshua called those people together to review and to remind the people of Israel that they were bought, purchased, and or redeemed by precious blood. And he reminds them that this blood marked them and it identified them and it says whose they are. Listen, we may not be able to influence our nation, our state, or even our county, but we can and we should influence those people who are closest to us. That's why we need to remember 
that he is ours and we are his. The second thing is he called them together to review how God had fought for their liberty. Not only had he bought their liberty, but he fought for their liberty. Look in verse 11 and 12 of Joshua 24. He said, you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you. And the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Gergesites and the Havites and the Jebusites, thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or by your bow. God did the fighting. God did the conquering. The speech was made, Joshua's speech here was made many years after they had already entered into the promised land. New generations were coming along with new leadership. And Joshua seeks to remind them that as long as they stay with the Lord, the Lord will fight their battles for them. I want to say that again. As long as we stay with the Lord, the Lord will fight our battles for us. He reminds them, Joshua reminds them, in chapter 23, he had already said in verse 12, if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations which remain among you and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations, but they will be a snare and a trap and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off the good land which the Lord God has given you. God is for us. God will fight for us. And all we've got to do is stand with him. We don't have to fight the battles. We can't even fight the battle. We don't have any power. That's why he says in Ephesians 6.10, put on the, he says, stand in the, in the power and the might of the Lord. We don't have any power and might. We've got to stand in his power and his might. Now, Christian people, we need to remember that, that the Lord fights for us when we stand for him. Let me just show you in, in, in Joshua chapter 5, there's an interesting story that happens there, and it's per pertinent to hear. I want you to see this. In Joshua 5, verse 13, this was prior to ever fighting a single battle. This is what happened. Joshua 5, 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a, with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed his face to the ground in homage and asked him, What does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did that. Now, if we are left, if they were left, to, on their own to conquer Jericho, they never would have been able to do it. Jericho was a walled city. It had, it had, it's one of the oldest cities in the world. They couldn't conquer it. They're nomads. On their own, they had no way of conquering this, and they would have never done it. But God is establishing the truth to them, and the truth is he is the one that gives victory. We should remember that. Joshua did not recognize this angel. He didn't know it was the captain of the Lord's army. He didn't know who it was. So Joshua walks up to him and he says, dude, are you on our side or are you on their side? What was the answer? The answer was, I ain't on nobody's side. I'm on my side. You see, that's, that, that, that's important because, listen, God is not on my side. God is not on their side. The question is, am I on God's side? You see, there's a big difference right there because there's a lot of people who go around all the time and they get their life in a mess and then they want to claim it and they want to aim it and they want to confess it and they want to rebuke it and they want to do all... Listen, God is not up there just trying to untangle our messes. Listen, I, I believe in prayer. If you're in a mess, you need to pray. But let me tell you something. God fights for those people who stand for him. 
You want know, one of the key phrases in the book of Joshua is after this occasion when, when Joshua runs into the captain of the Lord's army, the key phrase in the book of Joshua from that point on is he smote them with the edge of the sword. And Joshua won every victory from that point on. Listen, the Bible says in Ephesians 6.10, uh, Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The issue for the children of Israel was they were getting soft. They, 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 they were a new generation who had not experienced the hardships of wandering. They had not experienced the bloodiness of war. They, they took for granted all the blessings they were enjoying. Their forefathers fought those battles. They inherited lands that they didn't, they didn't purchase. They inherited houses they didn't build. They inherited the rest. And the battle of the previous generations, they didn't know anything about. And what they failed to realize is, is the job wasn't done. There were still more lands to conquer. There were still more sin to overcome. There are still more battles to be won. It's not time to quit. It's not time to back down. It's time to go forward, he says. And they were, they were getting soft, and the job wasn't done. They were, there were still enemies that need to be conquered. Listen, God's people, we need to realize... They're coming for our children. And I'm not talking about this bunch of weirdos. I'm talking about the culture. I'm talking about the culture that we live in. It's worse than the Philistines ever imagined. And they're coming for our children. And we need to realize that we, as God's people, are locked into a spiritual battle for the souls of our children and our grandchildren. And all we need to do is to stand with God. And he'll fight our battles. As we review our walk with God, we need to remember that we were bought with precious blood. We need to remember that Jesus fought and won our liberty on the cross, and he will continue to fight for us as long as we stand with him. Number three, we need to review how God brought us into liberty. In verses 5 and 7 of Joshua 24, he says, then I, sent, then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in their midst. And afterwards, I brought you out. I brought your forefathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen uh, to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did, it, did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your, your hand. You took possession of their land when I destroyed them. You see the number of times God brought them out, and then God brought them in? Exodus 19.4 says, uh, God... Uh, he, he, Moses says to the people, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Exodus 32, 11, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spreads its wings and caught them and carried them on his pinions. The picture there is of an of a, of a, of a, a, a eagle teaching a baby eagle how to fly. And what the mother eagle does is she nurses that baby until it gets big enough. It can't take the nest anymore. It's too big. So they climb up on the edge to get some air, you know, look around. They're way up high. Well, you know what that mother eagle does? She swoops down there and knocks him right off. He goes flopping down the side of a cliff. He starts flapping his wings. If he ain't got it flying down, she swoops under him. She catches him. She brings him right back up. She sets him off in the nest again. He's thinking, Wow. Before he even gets his breath, she knocks him off again. That repeats until he finally learns to fly. That's the way God dealt with Israel, you see. He bore them on eagles' wings. Now, how many of us can testify that God has carried us through? Can I get a witness? Listen, I want you to see something. Their journey began with liberation. That is, God bought them. Then it continued in the wilderness. God brought them through, and they were taken to the promised land. God brought them in. 
By the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, God brings us out of condemnation. That's what we call justification. And that liberates us from the penalty of sin. By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God brings us through, that is, sanctification, liberating us from the power of sin. Now, ultimately, God will bring us in. We call that glorification when we all get to heaven. And when we get to heaven, that will forevermore liberate us from the presence of any and all sin. And so through the cross, he has set us free from the penalty. He is setting us free from the power. And one day, ultimately, forevermore, we will be separated from the presence of sin. His salvation is full and complete, and we need to review that in Jesus' name. Amen? You say, well, why is this possible? How can it be that he can liberate us from all of the sin that we've done? Listen to what the Bible says in Luke twenty-two nineteen. Jesus took some bread. When he given thanks, he broke and gave it to him, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, and he said, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you free? Are you blessed? Are you a child of God? Review, review this morning that you were bought with precious blood. His blood makes you separated and distinct from the condemnation of the world. Review how God has fought and won every single battle that was his. Furthermore, he will continue to fight and win every single battle that is his. He fights for us who stands with him. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, and then consider that he brought you out, he is bringing you through, and ultimately, he, the Bible says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Not only did he bring us out, he's going to bring us through, and hallelujah, one of these days he's going to bring us in. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go, hallelujah. Listen, if the rapture happened right now, uh, we don't even have to have a business meeting. Hallelujah. We can just all go. Praise God. And so he is going to bring us in. Praise his holy name. So I want you to just stop for a minute and think about all the blessings that we enjoy. The blessings of redemption. He brought us out. Blessings. He, 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 brought, he bought us. He, he fought for us. And he's bringing us in. And so with that in mind, we have a choice. The choice to renew the covenant. Now, God's people make a difference in this world. Do you all believe that? God's people make a difference in this world. The Bible says, Jesus said, you are the salt and the light of this world. Now, salt preserves and adds flavor. Light illuminates in the darkness. Often, God's people don't realize what an impact they are having. Most of you don't realize what an impact and ability that you have to impact. There are, there are little guys, little girls, they're watching every single thing each and every one of us does. They don't miss a word, man. They hear it all. And we need to realize that we need to lift up our heads and remember that we are doing sanctified business for the Lord God in this church. I heard about three men that were digging one day. Somebody went up to him and said, what are y'all doing? One guy said, I'm just digging a ditch, man. Just digging a ditch. Other guy said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm laying a foundation. The third guy, he, he throwed his shovel down. He took a look at the sky and he said, we are building a temple for God. Well, that means your perspective has everything to do with how you work. Joshua calls these people together, and he's trying to get them to remember that they are God's covenant people. They are the people of God. They are not pagans. That's what he wants them to realize. They are different, and they need to act differently. Now, let me give you three things, and I'm done. First thing I want you to see is there's an invitation to renewal. An invitation in verse 14. Joshua says, now this is a gracious invitation. God invites us to renew our, our walk with him. 
Verse 14, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods of your father, serve beyond the river in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Joshua says, it's time to get off the fence. Time to stop straddling the fence. I, I, I don't know if you got fond memories of the playground at school. I mean, that can be great or it can be a nightmare. I don't know, but it depends. On, but one thing I remember, you know, somewhere around the third, fourth grade, maybe second grade, I don't, I don't remember. They had this thing out there. It was a death machine. It, it was a, they called it a teeter-totter. Y'all remember these? They still have them? I'm surprised they hadn't outlawed them. They outlawed everything else. That was fun. But anyway, uh, the teeter-totter. The principle is two children of equal size get on each end, and they bounce back and forth, and it's lots of fun. But how about that kid? I'm mad about thinking about it. He wouldn't get on either end. He got up there and did this. I teeter-totter myself. You can't get on. Didn't you want to just knock him off? Say, dude, you get on one end, I'll get on the other. We'll both enjoy this thing. Listen, uh, too many of God's people are straddling the teeter-totter. They got one foot in the world, one foot in the church, and they're saying, I don't want to go either way. I want to straddle the fence. Joshua says, get off and get with it. Listen, Jesus said the same thing. He said, no man, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, he'll be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. God invites us to review and then to renew our commitment to following him, to discipleship, to righteousness, to love one another, to act like the bride of Christ. And then Joshua gives the altar call. And they all rush forward to make a commitment. But then Joshua just like puts the, puts the brakes on. He says, hold on. Before you sign a commitment card, before you do anything, I've got an admonition for you. An admonition is a warning. Look in verse 19 and verse 20. This is the admonition to renewal. Then Joshua said to the people, you'll not be able to serve the Lord because he's a holy God. He is a jealous God. He'll not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. Now keep in mind, Joshua is speaking Old Testament. The covenant that they were under contained, I'm talking about the, the Sinai covenant when Moses sprinkled the blood, it contained both blessings and cursings. And God had promised to bless them if they served Him and followed Him and obeyed Him, but they were also promised curses if they began to follow other gods because God was a jealous God. And so in this text, when he says you can't serve the Lord, he don't mean that it's impossible. It's contingent phrase. It means as long as you are got these Amorite gods and these gods from beyond the river, you can't serve the Lord. You have got to make a decision. You've got to clean your house. You've got to get right. What he's saying. And so the good news is, is we're not under the old covenant. Did you know we're under the new covenant? And you know what? There's not a single curse associated with the new covenant. No, not one. Because Jesus died on the cross and the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus took the curse that you and I deserve. And you say, well, if that's true, then that means our salvation is secure. Listen, the new covenant enacted and it was fulfilled by Christ, and that means our salvation is complete. We can't earn our salvation. We can't improve our salvation, nor can we even forfeit our salvation. You say then, well, how can we renew our walk with God? I'm glad you asked, because I read it to you in the Scripture reading. Check this out. Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, therefore, now therefore means based on everything I've already said, this. Now, I don't have time to read the first 11 chapters of Romans, but basically he talks about God's mercy, and this is what he says. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. 
review what God has done in your life. He has bought you, he has fought for you, and he has brought you to this place. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, and here it is, here's what we can do. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That's where we renew. We come to the altar. Listen, most of us will never be in any kind of position to change the world. And thankfully, none of us are called to do that. We're not great people. We're not great influential people and women, men and women. Not by the world's definition. But we can do this. We can be salt and light for these children that come to this church. We can be salt and light to all the people that God brings to this church. We can be uh, salt and light, and we can can teach our own children the Word of God. We can make disciples of those people who come into this place. When we receive and we review how God has brought and fought and bought us, we're faced with the same ancient call, and that is serve Him in sincerity and truth, and choose for yourselves today who you will serve. Listen, in view of God's mercy, in view of all that God has done for us, in view of His redemption, in view of Him giving His only begotten Son, in view of Him uh, filling us with the Holy Spirit and walking with us and sanctifying us and working with us and promising us eternal life, this is where we all get in line and say, sign me up for something. Because listen, if God's done all that to me, I'll keep the children, I'll make Kool-Aid, I'll set up tables, I can do that. And so, I'll expect to see you all in the Welcome Center after church. (laughs) And the people said in verse 24, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey His voice. Now there's one final thing I want you to see. And that is they ratified their statement. They rat- the ratification of the renewal. Look in verse 24. People said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and we'll obey his voice. Look at this. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and he set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against you. For it's heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. Thus it shall be a witness against you so that you do not deny your God. And Then Joshua dismissed the people each to his inheritance. Seven times, seven times in the book of Joshua, they set up monuments. You may remember when they crossed the Jordan River, as they got across, they got some stones and they built an altar inside the Jordan River, and then the waters came back over. And then they they made seven uh, other, and, and each one of these monuments was placed in a strategic place to remind future generations of what the Lord had done for them. Each monument told a different story to remind later generations of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I I like to visit Civil War battlefields. And I don't, I'm not crazy about all that stuff like, well, anyway, I I like to go there and see what happened. And I've been to Gettysburg three times. And uh, I just find that to be a very interesting thing. The fact that people would line up by the the thousands and just shoot each other. It's just amazing to me. Maybe I'm strange. But anyway, uh, we we, we go up there. Uh, What I've learned from going to Gettysburg is that uh, it was the strategic turning point of the Civil War. Now, I know some of y'all will probably correct me on that, but that's what they say at Gettysburg, okay? And uh, uh, 
the southern armies were one of the most interesting places at Gettysburg is called the Little Round Top. Some of y'all been there, you know exactly what I'm, I'm saying. It was, it was uh, occupied by, I think it was the New York uh, militia, and, and they had dug in, but they didn't have any ammo. And the southern troops had marched, and they were exhausted. And they began to march up the hill, and they were shooting at the, at the Union Army at the Little Round Top. And so the Union Army was able to, to deflect them and to run them back down and, and beat them back. But then they regrouped, and they were coming for a second charge. But here's what the problem was. The Union troops didn't have any more ammo. They were flat out of ammo. And the southern troops were headed up the hill. Now, understand something. The Battle of Gettysburg is the pivotal battle in the Civil War. The battle on the Little Round Top is what turned the battle in favor of the North. But the Northern Army is up on the hill. They got no more bullets. And the Southern Army is coming up, and they've got bullets. And so the commander of the Northern Army... He did something, and this is what changed the entire war. He said, fellas, fix bayonets. Fix bayonets, and we sh when you see them coming, charge. And that changed the course of our nation. How will future generations look at our Christianity? Will they look back and say, yeah, they had a consumer-based Christianity based on their personal convenience? Or will they say, yeah, that was the age of Internet Christians? Or will they look back and will they say, that generation fixed bayonets, spiritually speaking, charge the enemy. And listen, if we do that, they will look back and they will say those people were different. They tried to live their lives to honor Christ, and if they say that about us, we will have changed the world. And beloved, that's way better than screaming at the TV. Would you stand with me this morning? Bow your head and close your eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just stand solemnly and think about what the Lord is saying to you in your heart right now? Maybe today is the day that you surrender your life to Christ. You've been hearing these messages. You've been hearing all about the blood of Jesus. and You've been hearing about His substitutional death. The only thing you need to do is just surrender and let, let Jesus have your life. In just a few moments, we're going to offer the invitation. The invitation is a time when we make decisions. Now, you can make a decision sitting in your seat. That's fine. But sometimes people like to come uh, and pray at the altar as just a way to just really let God know they mean business. Sometimes it, you come with a friend. But we also give a public invitation because the Bible says, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. So I believe we ought to ask people to publicly commit their lives to Christ. He died publicly for you. You should confess Him publicly if you haven't yet. And then if you want to join our church, if you've been immersed like you saw this morning, after your salvation, we accept your statement of faith. But maybe this morning you have been saved. You've asked Jesus to be your Savior, and you want to be baptized. Well, if you just come up, we got pastors up here. It, it, just tell us. We'll, we'll set a time uh, and, and meet with you later to talk about it. Maybe you want to join our church. This is the invitation time for you to respond. I'm going to pray and just, just trust that you're going to do what God leads on, lays on your heart to do. Father, we pray. We thank you for the liberty that is ours because you bought us, you fought for us, and then you brought us out and you're going to bring us in. 
And we just pray today that we'll all renew our faith in Jesus' name. Amen.